good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to session on Java on Crack. I think we might need to have a chat with marketing people about the naming of this particular project. Uh, I know we had some fun because we were talking about this project internally and somebody suggested, well, what about if we have a centralized service and then we could, that, we could call that the Crack Dealer? Um, but it's not about uh, illicit substances. This is a project that we started at Azul where we were looking at how can we enable applications that run on the JVM, so not necessarily just Java applications, it could be written in other languages like Kotlin and so on, but how can we allow applications on the JVM to start up more quickly? And there's lots of different ways that people have tried to approach that, and we'll talk through some of those ideas, but then I'm really gonna focus on what it is we actually done with this project uh, how it works and how you can use it, and then at the end, I'll show you a demo of it actually in action. So the first thing to think about is why is Java so popular? And you can have a number of different answers to that. So the answers I came up with were, well, it's a great language. Uh, I certainly like it. I've been using it for you know 25 odd years. The fact that many people turn up to conferences like this is an indication of its popularity. Even just recently, I think it was earlier this week, the Tayobi Index came out and Java is still in the top three most popular languages, which is great. It's also very frequently in the most unpopular languages, which is also good because if you listen to, uh, I think it was Bjorn Struestrup, and I probably pronounced that really badly, but the, the person who invented C++, and he said that there are only two programming languages. The programming languages that people don't like and the programming languages that people don't use. So I think that it's fair to say that you know, Java is still maintaining its popularity. And one of the reasons for that is because it's easy to read and it's easy to write. We're certainly seeing that at the moment with a lot of the changes from Project Amber, we're taking some of those rough edges off, eliminating boilerplate code, and we're seeing steps to maintain that readability but without having to write quite so much code. The other thing you can think of as why Java is so popular is it's got lots of libraries. If you're starting a project, there are lots of platforms and, and frameworks and libraries that you can rely on to enable you to do a lot of the, the work without having to reinvent the wheel. And there's either like free open source versions or there's ones that are commercial. And of course, there's a great community. The fact that you know we're all sitting here at a conference which is well primarily focused on Java, there are Java user groups, there's Java champions, all sorts of things like that, and it's you know, easy to find Java programmers. But I think the real reason why Java has maintained its popularity over so long is the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine. And right from the very beginning, Sun had this catchphrase, write once, run anywhere. The fact that you can take a piece of compiled code and move it from one platform to another without having to recompile, without having to change your code. Or as many people refer to it, write once, test everywhere. The other thing is that with, in terms of the JVM, there's excellent backwards compatibility. That's one of the things that's really helped Java, again, to maintain its, its popularity. You can literally take code that was written and compiled on JDK 1.2 and run it on JDK 18, JDK 19 without any changes. Um, I did actually try to run JDK 1.0 code on JDK 19, but the problem was the only actual compiled applications I could find were applets. And they just didn't, you know, there is no applet uh, plugin, there is no um, uh, applet viewer available on JDK 19. But the important thing about that is the managed runtime environment. Now, what that means is that when you start up a Java application, there's a lot more going on than if you just start, a, start up an application which has been written in a language like C or C++ and compiled directly into the instructions for a particular platform. What we see here is a diagram that shows what's going on. So the first thing is that the JVM itself is an application. So when you start that, it will start running native instructions for the platform it's running on it will need to load and initialize all of that code. But then it also needs to do a lot of work to start itself up and get itself ready to execute bytecodes. One of the things I actually learned fairly recently is that the interpreter that is used for bytecodes 
actually at runtime, when you start up the JVM, generates all of the templates for each of those byte codes every single time you start it up. And that's quite impressive, because you think, well, there's actually quite a lot of work that has to be done, but it happens very, very quickly. Then you've got the actual application startup, where your classes need to be loaded, your jar files need to be unpacked, you need to initialize whatever classes are needed to start the application up, and then there's the application-specific startup code where you're running main, then you've got to start up you know, connection to your database, connection to the network, and things like that. And then there's this third part, which is the application warm-up. It's slightly different. And the, the thing about the first two is that you can think of those as the time to first operation, as in how long is it going to take before your application is ready to do anything. And that tends to be pretty quick. Because if you look at the, the other one, uh, moving across everything, you've got time to end operations. The application warm-up is where you've got to do the compilation of the methods that are being used very frequently, the just-in-time compilation. But then you've also got the application that's doing sort of processing of these things. And in terms of how long these different sections take, what you'll find is that the JVM startup is, is fast. You know, it's going to be of the order of you know, milliseconds to get an application or get the JVM started up on a modern platform. Even with creating all the templates, it's really quite quick. You're not going to be able to improve that because if you think, it, let's say it takes up 20 milliseconds to start up the JVM, improving that by 50%, you're still only going to be taking 10 milliseconds. So most people aren't going to notice the difference. Application startup is quick, but it's not as quick as you know, starting up the JVM really depends a lot on how many classes you're loading, what overhead there is in terms of the initialization code within your application, and so on. But again, that tends to be fairly quick. It's the, the application warm-up time which is the real long part of that. It's analyzing all of those methods, figuring out which bits of code to compile, and then doing the compilation. So this is where we get into the idea of JVM performance warm-up. What we see is, in terms of the, the way that code gets executed, there's, again, three phases to that. When you start running a class file, what you're dealing with is bytecodes. Bytecodes, as we know, are the instructions for a virtual machine, not a real machine. And what has to happen there is that we interpret them. These are these templates that we have for each of those bytecodes. So we take each bytecode in turn and we use the template that's been created for the native instructions, execute those, move on to the next bytecode, and so on. There's really no optimization that happens at that level at all. There's, there's, the only thing that happens is that for certain situations, I think there's probably three, maybe four, pairs of bytecodes that happen very, very frequently together. So those pairs of bytecodes will get their own template. But that's, that's it. Every single bytecode otherwise is executed on its own in interpretive mode. Because of that, Java runs slowly in interpretive mode. If you go right back to the beginning of Java, one of the big complaints when it first came out was that it was slow compared to C and C++. And that's quite a legitimate complaint because it was. The developers of Java looked around and they said, oh, there's this great idea that other people have used before called just-in-time compilation. Let's use that for the JVM. What we do now is we monitor each time we call a method, and we keep a track of that, so that when we get to a certain threshold, we'll identify that method as being a hotspot of code, hence the name of the JVM. Having identified it as a hotspot, we'll pass it to an internal compiler, and that compiler will take all of the byte codes in that method and convert them into one set of native instructions that can then be executed each time we call the method, rather than having to interpret each bytecode in turn. This is good. It improves performance. And the way we do that is using the very uh, originally named C1 JIT compiler. That's designed to compile code very quickly, but it doesn't do a lot of optimization. It'll do some basic optimizations, but not really heavy optimization. Once we've compiled that code, we run it and continue to keep a track, but we also profile the method to understand how it's being used. When we get to another threshold and we say this is a really hot spot of code, 
we then pass it to the, again, very originally named C2 JIT compiler. This time, we recompile the code using the profiling information, taking longer to do it, but generating much more heavily optimized code that can then take advantage of all the sort of uh, techniques that we have available to us. The problem with this is the, the fact that every time you start your application up, it does exactly the same thing. So it has to start running in interpretive mode. It then has to go through the process of analyzing which methods get called frequently, compiling them with C1, waiting for them to be used more frequently, profiling them, recompiling them with C2, and getting to the hot code. So we end up with a performance graph for Java, a typical Java application, not every Java application, but a typical Java application will look something like this. So we start off on the left-hand side, slow performance because we're running in interpretive mode. So that's the sort of yellow section there. Then we compile various methods using C1. We start to get more performance because we get faster code. And then we get to the blue section, which is where we're running C2 compile code. More and more methods get compiled and we end up with our sort of optimum level of performance when we've settled down all the frequently used methods are compiled with C2. They've been optimized as much as possible. And we get our steady state of performance. How long this takes is what we call the application warm-up time. And that can be a long time. I mean, it can be minutes. It can be, I mean, typically you would say for a long-running application, that could be an hour, easily an hour to take that. Or it could be longer, depending on how your application actually exercises the code and what it does. It could take a lot longer than an hour to get to that optimum level of performance. Now, as I say, the problem is that when we run our application the first time, we go through this process of analyzing and compiling and doing all that. And then we throw everything away so that the next time we run it, we do exactly the same thing. And if we run it a third time, we see exactly the same thing. This is not great because we're not seeing wonderful performance characteristics in terms of reusing the knowledge that we've had from previous runs. What we'd really like to see is a situation where we run the application once, we get it to a warmed up state, everything's working the way we want it to, and then when we run it again, we get exactly the same level of performance we had, all the code's optimized, everything's running great, and then we run it a third time, we see the same thing. Okay, so that's what we're really looking for. Now, there are, as I said, there are a number of different approaches that you can take to how to improve that. One of the things that has been done recently is the inclusion of application class data sharing in the OpenJDK. It used to be what Oracle determined as a, a commercial feature, but now it's been brought into the OpenJDK. And the idea behind this is that when you start up an application, think of that sort of middle section where we're loading classes, we're initializing classes and doing various work to get the application to the point where it can do its first transaction. And the work that the JVM does in that sense is to take the class file, read it in, unpack it, get all the information about it in terms of the you know, various details of that. And it creates internal data structures which represent the class that's just been loaded. And when it gets initialized, it gets uh, additional information in terms of the data structures for that. If we start the application again, we do the same thing. So we have to load the classes, create those internal data structures. With application class data sharing, the idea is that having loaded the application once, you can then have the JVM and tell it to do this and say, right, I want to keep that information. And what it does is it essentially takes the area of memory that's got all these internal data structures and writes them out to a file. When you start the application again, what it does is it says, right, let's use that file that we've just written out, map that straight into memory, so we don't have to do anything complicated with it, just literally map it into memory, point the JVM pointer that's required for those internal data structures to that mapped in area, and suddenly you've got everything available to you. You don't have to go through the process of having to load it each time. The other advantage of that is that if you're running the same application and you want to run it multiple times, rather than having your JVM create copies of the, the class data structures, it can 
by mapping that area into memory, can reuse the same area because it's read-only rather than rewrite, you can share that amongst multiple JVMs and it reduces the footprint of the whole set of JVMs across your application. So this is very good from an efficiency point of view from dealing with that first sort of two sections, like the, the idea of actually getting to the point where you can do a single transaction. So this is a good start, but it doesn't really address many of the issues that we have. So the next thing that people often suggest is, well, okay, if C and C++ code natively compiled is faster in terms of startup, why don't we just do that? Let's take our Java code and compile it into native instructions. I know that I'm going to be running it on a Linux machine, running on an Intel processor. So why do I care about having the ability to run it on a Windows machine running on an ARM processor if I'm never going to do that? This is fine. This is an idea. Ahead of time, static compilation. However, what, what we need to think about there is that's good because no interpreting of bytecodes. Great. So we don't start off slow. We don't have to analyze looking for all those hotspots. We don't have to do compilation of our code as the application is running, which again is good because the, the act of doing that compilation takes resources away from the application doing its own work. And if you're in a container where you've got a limited number of vCores, let's say you've only got two vCores for your container, and one of those vCores is actually doing compilation, suddenly you've reduced the potential throughput of your application by 50% while you're doing the warm-up. If you use AOT code, you don't have to do that. You start at full speed straight away. Great. So essentially what we've done here is, you know, what Graal does. So Graal can create a native image for an application written in Java, and it will generate a binary that you can then execute on a particular platform, and everything is, as we say above, no interpreted bytecodes, no analysis, no compilation, start at full speed. So we solve problem. OK, so that's the end of the presentation. Let's just go away, and we'll just use Graal. Except no. I have 33 minutes left, so I have more to talk about. Not so fast. And this is the important thing. Not so fast. If you think about it, ahead of time compilation is, by definition, static. Now, Java, as a language, is, is statically typed. I almost said dynamically typed there. No, it is statically typed. We cannot change the type of a variable once we've created it. But it is a very dynamic language in other ways because we can do things like class loading at runtime. And the thing about doing ahead of time compilation is that we're compiling the code before it is run, very obviously, ahead of time. What that means is that the compiler is going to have no knowledge of how that code is actually going to run. It can certainly look at the code and it can apply static analysis, it can apply static optimizations to that in terms of like dead code analysis and dead code elimination, uh, various things like that, method inlining, things like that. That's limited in terms of what you can do. Now, there is an approach to help with that, one that's been around again since really compilers started, which is called profile guided optimization. This is one of the things that Graal uses in the Enterprise Edition. Essentially what you say is, right, let's take our code, let's compile it into native instructions statically, then let's run it and profile it as it's running. Feed that profile back into the compiler, recompile the code again, but now we've got some knowledge about what's likely to happen as we run it, and use that to optimize to be more efficient based on what we've got. But of course, the downside of that is that you're still fixing it based on one particular run of the application. If you've got an application whose profile changes a lot in terms of its use, then PGO is going to be somewhat limited in terms of how much it's going to be able to help you. Now let's talk about other things that we can do in terms of improving the efficiency of our code because we can run things and we can compile things at runtime. This is an example of a speculative optimization. And speculative optimizations are all about, as you would expect from the name, you speculate that if code has run in a particular way up to the point where you're compiling it, let's speculate 
that it will continue to work in that way. First example here is what we call monomorphic site inlining. I've got a class called animal, and it just encapsulates a, a value color, and I've got an accessor method for that, get color. All it does is return the color. Great, simple data object. Now, if I, I use that code and I call the method to get the color, technically what the compiler is going to do is it's going to say, right, to call that method, it needs to create a stack frame, pop that on, or push that onto the stack, call the method, get the value, put it in the return, and then pop the stack frame off. That's very inefficient because we're creating a stack frame, popping the stack frame, all for the sake of getting one value. The compiler will look at that, and this is a very basic sort of optimization. Simply say, well, you've marked color as private, but I know that since the getColor method just returns the value of color, from the purposes of compilation, I'll treat it as a public variable. So I'll forget about calling that method. I'll simply reference the color directly through the animal reference, and I can get the value and return it. So that's a very efficient way of doing things. It's, it's essentially method inlining. But the problem with that is because Java is dynamic in the sense of class loading, we could at runtime load something which would replace the method get color with something that does a lot more complexity. And it may need to do different things rather than just returning the color. So we can inline that method if we do it at runtime, because we can see exactly which classes are loaded, inline that code, and then if somehow later on we have a, a new class loaded and we find that, oh, that's not right, we can actually throw away the code and then recompile it based on the fact that they've got a new method that we can do that. This is something that's very difficult, if not impossible, to do in terms of static compilation, because you then can't rely on something unless you work in a closed world, where you have to define all the classes you're going to use before you actually run the application. And that prevents you from them doing dynamic class loading at runtime. Slightly more complicated example of speculative optimization is branch analysis. Now, th this method is somewhat convoluted in terms of the, the way I put it together, but it's good for demonstrating exactly what you can do with a speculative optimization. So I've got a method here, compute magnitude, takes a value as a parameter. What I then do is I test to see if the value is greater than nine. If it is, I call compute bias with the value and I get my bias back from that. If it's not greater than nine, I simply set bias to be one. Then I'm going to return the log base 10 of bias plus 99. I said it was convoluted. I mean, I'm not sure why you would do this, but there you go. What we can do in terms of profiling the code as it's running is count how many times we go through each branch of the if statement. So how many times you go through true, how many times you go through false. When we come to compile that, we can look at the, the counts and we can say, oh, look, we have never been through the true branch. Zero count for the true branch. Let's optimize the code based on the assumption that we won't go through the true branch in the future. And we can do this. We can say, OK, compute magnitude method takes value. Now what we do is we still have to have a test to see if value is going to be greater than 9. The reason for that is because we obviously have a contract between our code and the compiler, which we have to respect. And at some point, we may get a value that's greater than 9. If that happens, we call uncommon trap. Uncommon trap is essentially saying, we've made a mistake in terms of our optimization. Throw away the code for this method and recompile it based on the original code that we had, the full layout. But if we don't, because we know that bias is always going to be 1, 1 plus 99 is 100, log base 10 of 100 is 2, Let's forget about doing all of that work and just return two. So now we've heavily optimized this code so that we don't have to do all of the extra stuff. We just return two every time, so long as we don't have a value greater than nine. So this is all about speculative optimizations. And what we found as all is that in terms of measuring the way that we get better performance from our compiler code is over 50% of the performance gains in terms of JIT, just-in-time compilation, are down to speculative optimizations. But obviously, they only work if you, you can uh, de-optimize when your assumptions prove wrong. If you're trying to do static 
ahead of time compilation, you're going to be limited in terms of those speculative optimizations. The only way you can really do that is by, by guessing and creating multiple paths through the code so that you can say, let's have one way of interpreting that, or one way of, of dealing with that method. If we don't have a value greater than nine, let's have another way of compiling the code if we have a value that is greater than nine. But that gets very complicated and leads to much, much bigger executables. The thing that you will say about that, though, is de-optimizations where we've made an assumption which proves to be wrong are very bad for performance. We've compiled code, we've gone through that optimization analysis, then we've had to throw it away, and now we have to recompile it again. So lots of wasted cycles in terms of what happens. We have to go back to either interpretive mode, maybe we go back to C1 compiled code. So if we compile AOT and JIT, basically, if you look at AOT, Class loading prevents method inlining. You can't do runtime bytecode generation because there are no bytecodes involved. It's all native code. Reflection is complicated. You can do it. Again, it becomes a closed world, meaning that you have to declare, in effect, the things that you want to reflect on ahead of time. You can't use speculative optimizations unless you do multiple code paths. And overall, the performance will typically be lower. So I do say typically, but typically it will be lower. The advantages are obviously full speed from start, and you don't have the overhead of CPU to do the compilation as the application is running. On the JIT side of things, it's really the opposite. So you can use aggressive method inlining. You can use bytecode generation at runtime. I say reflection is relatively simple. I don't think you could ever describe reflection as simple per se. And you can use speculative optimizations, resulting in typically Overall, your performance will be higher. But the downside is it requires the warm-up time and you've got the CPU overhead to compile the code. So if we do a comparison and we look at our speed graph again, if we take the one where we've got JIT compile code, this is the level that we're going to see after warm-up, our sort of 100% performance level. Compare that to ahead of time compiled code what you'll see is a much faster startup because you immediately start at full speed. But the overall speed that you're going to get is typically going to be lower. Even if you apply profile-guided optimization to that, that will bring it up a bit further, but it's still not going to get you the same level of performance you get with JIT compiled code. So essentially what we can take away from this is if we want the best possible performance for our, our application, we need JIT compiled code at the end of the day. So one of the other things that we did, I just need to mention this, is, is we came up with the idea of what we call ready now. And ready now is the idea that you run your application and you let it warm up. Having let it warm up, you take a profile of the application and you record that into a file. What that profile contains is five distinct things. So the first is a list of all the currently loaded classes. Then it contains a list of all the currently initialized classes which could be a subset of loaded classes, because you may not have initialized all the, the ones that you've loaded, all the JIT profiling data that was collected until the point where you took the profile, and then any de-optimizations that occurred, so the mistakes you made in terms of getting to that point. And then we also take a copy of all the compiled code that was generated for that platform. When you restart your application, you use it with that file. Because of that, the JVM already knows exactly what it needs to do to start your application in the best possible way. So it can load and initialize all of the classes from those lists. Then it can load the code or possibly compile methods, depending on whether they match and so on, all of which happens before you get to your main entry point. So when you get to your main entry point, you'll be running at about 98% of the performance that you got when you took that profile. Two or three transactions just to kind of kickstart things and then give you the same level of performance you had. So if we simplify that performance graph, without ready now, you see a warm-up slope, and then you've got your optimized performance level. With ready now, we change that. So great, now it looks a lot more like that uh, ahead of time compile graph, except we've got the same overall level of performance. So we, we get much faster startup, much, far, much steeper graph there. Just one little problem there, you see, because if, you, if you're observant, you'll see that there is a slight change in that graph because there's this gap. And that gap is where the machine or the application is not doing anything. 
So it actually extends the time to first transaction because the JVM is doing all of the work ahead of time before you get to your main entry point. So for certain applications, this works very well. If you're doing things like trading applications where you know that the trading day starts at nine o'clock in the morning, what you can do is say, right, I know I need to start my application ahead of time to get that warm up and everything uh, happening, loading all the classes, compiling code and so on. But for things like microservices where you want that instant startup time, then this may not be the best approach. So these are all, all different types of things that we can do in terms of solving the problem. What about a different approach? So this is where we get into crack. In Linux, there is a thing called coordinated resume in user space, or as we try to pronounce it as a single word, cryu. And cryu is about essentially taking a running application and freezing it at a certain point, writing that into a set of files in user space, so your file system, and then being able to use them again when you want to restart your application. If you think about it, this is not that sort of complicated. I say not that complicated, but um, if you're running on the operating system, what you've got is multiple applications all running at the same time. And for those of you who are old enough to remember computers that had a single core and a single CPU, then we had time-sharing operating systems. We still do. Um, but the idea behind time-sharing system is that you switch very quickly between different tasks in order to give the illusion of them running at the same time. So you, it makes it look like they're running together, even though it's, it's switching very quickly between them. And that's done through context switching. Context switching in the operating system basically says, right, when you want to switch from one task, you record all the information in terms of the program counter, the values of the registers, the stack, and so on, store that away in memory, and then load in a previously running task at that point. So you've got the program counter, you've got your registers, and then simply start again from that point. All we're doing now is rather than doing a context switch into memory, we're doing a context switch where we write everything out to files on disk such that we can then reuse those things again from a point later on. Rather than it being milliseconds later, it's going to be seconds, days, weeks, however long you want to be. So we create a snapshot of the application as a set of files, and then we can use those wherever we want to after we, when we restart the application. So the, the cryo side of things is mostly implemented in user space. There are, there are a couple of things that went into the kernel to support this, but uh, they've been around since uh, version 3.11 of the kernel, so really anybody who's using any modern version of Java will have this available. The main goal behind Cryo was about microservice containers and migration of those containers uh, from one place to another. It does support a very extensive set of features, which is good. You can take, take processes, all of the threads within that process, all of the memory that's being used, whether it's memory mapped, files, shared memory, all of the open files, pipes, FIFOs, sockets, inter-process communication channels, timers and signals, everything gets written out. So you've got a complete image of your running application. And they even managed to come up with a way where they could rebuild the TCP connection for a network without having to do it through negotiation. You could actually rebuild the TCP connection from one end which, again, is quite an impressive thing to do. So we looked at that and said, OK, well, that, that's good, because the JVM is just a process. So why don't we use Cryo and say, take the JVM as the process, create a snapshot of that, and then write it out to files, and then we can reload it and run it again at some point later. That's good, so that, that, would, that would work. Except it does become more problematic, because things start to get very complicated when you're not taking you know, microseconds between when you write the information to some storage and then you reload it again. Because things have a habit of changing between when you deal with the, the checkpoint and when you do the restore. And it also becomes much more complicated if you say, well, let's take those files and restart the thing multiple times or move it to a different machine completely and try and restart it there. So we said, OK, we can work on Cryo but we need to kind of take it to the next level and do something in terms of how the JVM works, which is how we came up with coordinated restore at checkpoint, which is what CRAC actually stands for. 
The idea here is that coordinated bit. What we're going to do is actually make the application aware that it is going to be checkpointed and make the application aware that it is being restarted. That way, it can do certain things. So we have our application running quite happily. Then we decide to create a checkpoint. And what we do there is make the application aware so that it can tidy up various things. It can take whatever action is necessary before the checkpoint is created. Having created our checkpoint, we then wait some period of time, and then we restart it. But of course, we then need to tell the machine or tell the JVM that it's being restarted from this point. And so it can then do things in terms of uh, tidying up and so on, or so on in the reverse. What we also decided to do was to enforce more restrictions than Cryo did. We said it's actually not reasonable to have open file descriptors, open network connections for an application that we're going to checkpoint, because trying to restart later with the same network connection, with the same open files, could be very, very complicated. So let's make our lives a bit simpler. Let's not allow open files or open sockets. And in fact, we will abort if you do have an open socket or file. How this works is through a simple API. And the API is basically one where initially we define a resource. It's an interface so that you can look at your code and say, I've got some classes which need to be aware of doing a checkpoint and restore. If they need to be aware of doing a checkpoint and restore, all you do is implement the resource interface through that class. And you implement the two methods, which are very originally named before checkpoint and after restore. Probably don't need to give you too much um, clue about what those methods do. The idea being that by implementing these two methods, when the checkpoint occurs, the JVM will call that before checkpoint. You can do whatever you need to do to tidy up. When we get restored, the JVM will call the after restore method. You can do whatever needs to be done to then restore things. How we use that is through a context. So we have to make the JVM aware that even though we've implemented the interface, we then have to register those classes with the context so that the JVM knows which classes to call those methods on. We do that through a context. So we have a register method on there, takes a resource. And in terms of how you get that resource, sorry, how you get that context, you can create your own if you want, but there is a global context that's available directly from the JVM through the core class, which is a static method, so you can get that. And the idea is basically that when you implement the interface, you then call the register method on the context which you get from the core, and everything then is ready to go. So the, the way that we then work with that is that we've got our context maintaining a list of resources. When we do a checkpoint of the application, the JVM is going to call the, res the before checkpoint method in the order in which you registered those resources. And that's quite important because you then have the ability to say, right, I've got three classes, A, B, and C. But because of the way that I need to deal with things, I actually want the checkpointing to be done A, C, B. So by registering them as A, C, B, you know that the method is going to be called in that order. So you can deal with things and, and handle the things the way you want to do that. When the after restore is called, the list is reversed because that's quite logical. So if you've got A, C, B on the way down, so you've called those methods, when you do the restore, it'll be C, B, A. No, no, B, C, A, whichever is the reverse of what I said. Um, so that you then get them called in reverse, which means that it's essentially you're going down the stack and then coming back up the stack the other side. Let's look at an example. Take a, a very simple jetty type of thing, create a server manager, which we'll have a server for, and we're going to listen on port 8080, create a handler, and off we go. Wonderful. If we want to create a checkpoint of that running application, we can do it two ways. So the first way is externally. And we can say, use J command. We've added something into the JVM to allow you to do that. So we go J command, give it the name of the jar that we've executed, and simply say jdk.checkpoint. If we do that, we will see this wonderful message which says, command executed successfully. Unfortunately, this is one of those things that we really do need to fix, because it did not execute successfully. 
if you look in the log file, what you'll see is you've got a checkpoint open socket exception because we had created a server listening on a socket and we enforced the fact that we don't want open sockets in a checkpoint. So we looked at that and said, right, checkpoint open, ex uh, open socket exception. To get around that, we need to use the API. In our server manager, in the constructor, what we do is we use the core class called the get global context to get our context and then register this class as a resource on there. We also need to implement resource interface, which has the two methods before checkpoint and after restore. And in this case, all we have to do in our before checkpoint is to stop the server. So now we've closed the socket. And then when we restore, after restore, we just start the server up again and we reinitialize the socket that we use for that listener and everything then continues as it was before. So that then works quite happily. You can also, as a second way of doing this, you can actually do it programmatically, either through J command externally, or if you want to put it into your code, then you can use the checkpoint restore method on the core class. And when you call that method, it will do a checkpoint. When you return from that method is when the restore has completed. So you know that you go into it, checkpoint happens, come back from it, the restore has happened. So it's, it's pretty straightforward in terms of what that does. And of course, that could throw a couple of different exceptions based on whether you have a problem with doing the checkpoint or whether you have a problem doing the restore. How good is it? Well, um, let's look at some results. So we did a proof concept on JDK 17, and we put the functionality of Crack using Cryo underneath on the, uh, in the JDK. And we then ran some sort of sample applications to see how quickly we could do this. Spring Boot, good example. So we, the, the particular system we had it on, it took just under four seconds to get to first transa or first operation, I should say. If we use a checkpoint for that, we bring that down to 38 milliseconds. So that is two orders of magnitude faster. And remember that this is potentially, if you take the checkpoint later on, you can have all of that warmed up code, you can have everything in the way that you want it in terms of all the initialization has happened, everything's running at that point, and you've got 38 milliseconds to get to the same level of performance. Micronaut tried that as well, so that was uh, just over a second to get to first operation, that came down to 46 milliseconds. Quarkus, which obviously presents itself as a super fast startup, we can do even better with that. So 980 milliseconds comes down to 33 milliseconds. And then for some reason, we did some XML transform thing, which is probably not the best example. But uh, again, that was very similar in terms of uh, improvement in performance. The other thing is, of course, that this doesn't just lead to faster startup, but it can actually lead to better overall performance in terms of how long it takes to process a number of transactions. Because we don't have the warm-up time and the loading time and all of that involved, then if we compare how long it takes to deal with a certain number of requests, we can see here that the time it takes to deal with, you know, like 50,000 requests in terms of uh, Spring Boot in this example is lower than if we're using OpenJDK on its own. So that's another thing where you can think, oh, okay, that's an advantage of using uh, Checkpoint Restore. It's not just about um, the, the speed of startup, but how long it takes to actually process a certain number of transactions, throughput. And again, if we look at Quarkus, um, for some reason, the, the time it took to warm up was a bit longer there. So the difference between how long it takes to process transactions, again, is a little bit bigger. Just to summarize, um, this is still a project that we're working on. So there are many things that we're looking at in terms of how to improve this. One of them is about how to make the JVM more aware of the fact that it's doing a snapshot. It's already aware from this point of view that we tell it to do a snapshot. But there are things that we need to do internally to improve the efficiency of this. One of them is around the heap. Because if you think about it, if you've got a 32 gigabyte heap, we have to write all 32 gigabytes out to disk to make a copy of that heap, because we're, we're just assuming that everything is in that heap is, is valid. To get around that, obviously, it would be nice if, before we do the checkpoint, we have the garbage collector do a full compacting collection on the old generation, do a you know, quick collection on the young generation, promote anything, and so on, so that you minimize as much as possible the data that you need to write out from the heap. So it could be that you've only got like, I don't know, six gigabytes of live data in your heap, <laughs> 
rather than writing out 32 gigabytes to disk, you only write out a measly six gigabytes. But it's still going to be improving the ability of startup performance and also how much disk space you need to create a snapshot. The other thing is that the way we've designed this is not to tie it to the underlying technology. So it isn't tied to Cryo. We've, we've deliberately designed it so we could move it to other places. What we need to find are other ways of creating a snapshot at the operating system level. So uh, we've looked at things like uh, Docker supporting snapshots and things like that, but we, that actually uses Cryo as well. So um, th there's several things that we need to sort of investigate there. It has to be said that if this is ever going to make it into the OpenJDK mainline, then we have to make it cross-platform. And right now, it only runs on Linux because that's the only thing that has the support for um, doing a snapshot at the operating system level. Um, again, just to summarize, so Crack, interesting way to pause a JVM-based application. You can then restore it at some point in the future, possibly multiple times if you want to. Um, extremely fast startup time, but with the full level of performance. So all those, you know, uh, optimizations, all of the the um, speculative optimizations we can use, don't have to worry about ahead of time compile code or anything like that. Um, eliminates the uh, need for hotspot identification, so you don't have the load on the CPU as you start up. That's all done ahead of time. Don't need to worry about it. And there's a couple of links here to places with more information. So the other thing I'm going to do, just because I've got four minutes left, is just to show you a quick demo of this in action. So if I put my glasses on, because otherwise I can't see what I'm doing. It's the great thing about being middle-aged. Wearing glasses and contact lenses. Right, so I'm running Linux through VirtualBox here. And what I can do, uh, what's that? No, I don't want to do an update. Right, so what I can do here is I've, I've got a, a sample application that was written by my colleague, Gerrit Grunwald. And so if I just do start.shell, because that's, you know, I don't like typing. So essentially what we're doing here is we're gonna call Java, we're gonna say create a checkpoint to a particular directory on my filing sy file system, and then we'll just call the jar file, which has got our um, application in it. So if I run that, let's see, let's just do dot slash. Right, so what this is actually doing is it's creating a, a cache of prime numbers. We have to find something to do. And the cache of prime numbers takes a certain amount of time to fill up. And then what we do is over time we gradually uh, empty things out of the cache and start refilling it again. The net effect of that is it starts off slowly because it's having to fill up everything uh, initially and then it sort of gradually settles down and starts running uh, more quickly. So we can see the time that it takes to do each ex, um, each iteration of the, the loop is coming down. So now we're down to sort of 65 milliseconds. So what I can do is I can then take a uh, checkpoint of that running application. So we'll see that we're on, let's wait, wait till we get to 10. So we're on 10. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh dear. Yeah. I'm in the wrong directory. Uh, yeah, there we go. There we go, good, excellent. Right, so we got to run number 13 and we were down to 16 milliseconds. So what we've done now is taken a checkpoint and we can then restore that by just running the restore command. And I'll just show you the what we do there, which is simply to say Java. And this time, all we have to do is say, give it the crack files. So there's nothing else because everything is included in that. So if I do restore.shell, then we can see immediately we start running at number 14. And we can see it's 19 milliseconds. And so we, we've, we're at the right point for that. Now, the interesting thing that we found when we did this initially was that um, when we ran the restore, it went straight back to taking a long time to fill up the cache. And we thought, well, what's going on? We've, we've done a checkpoint. But then we realized it was because the system timer had moved forward by a long period of time. And the way that the cache was designed to work was looking at the system timer to see if it had exceeded a certain period. So this is one of those things where you learn that that's great because now we have you know, the ability to do before checkpoint and after restore is we keep a copy of what the system timer was when we did the checkpoint and then we can subtract that from the system timer and make the adjustment when we do the restore so that we, we get that, um, uh, that works in that sense. Um, the other thing I'll just show you very quickly because I am running out of time. Um, 
is that we can do it from Docker. So this is nice because what we did is basically put the same application inside Docker. And again, what we're doing here, as you can see that in this case, we, we started from run 18 and we got to uh, 21 milliseconds, 18 milliseconds. But the nice thing is you see that because it's in a container, what I can do is I can actually run it more than one time. So I can go, you know, okay, so I've got the same stored state, everything, and I can run it multiple times from the same container. And it's also nice that I can run it from within Docker on my Mac, and I don't have to run through Linux because it's already in the, the Docker container. So that's just basically to show you, that, you know, a couple of examples there. So as I've run out of time, I'm going to say thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.